It snowed that night, flakes softly blown in the cold blue lamplight. Snow lay in pale boas along the black tree limbs down Forest Avenue, and snow in the street bore bands of branch and twig, dark fissures that would not snow fool. He trudged home in a light fog of alcohol. A thin and distant bell was sounding, and he stopped to listen. Something flew, nameless bird. Such returned his face up to the night. The snowflakes came dodging out of the blackness beyond the lamps to settle on his lashes. Snow falling on Knoxville, sifting down over McAnally, hiding the rents and the roofing, draping the sash work, frosting the coal piles and the crab dooryards. It has covered up the blood and dirt and claggy sleech and gutterways and laid white lattice on the sewer grates. And snow has made cool bowers in the blackened honeysuckle, and it has hid the packing crates in the hobo jungles and wrought enormous pastry rings of truck tires there, where the creek addles along gorged with offal, upon whose surface the flakes impinge softly and are gone such returning up his collar. In the yards, a switch engine is working, and the white light of the headlamp bores down the rows of iron-gray warehouses in a livid phosphorus tunnel through which the snow falls innocently and unburnt. This seems to me, besides being a gorgeous passage, um, the first time we see Knoxville in terms like innocent, pure there's a sense that the snow covers all the kind of grime that we've been seeing uh throughout the novel Sutri lying in bed thinking about his life early on in the passage we the section we read for today thinks am i a monster are there monsters in me it's a good place to start today with that question. Is Sutri a monster? Are there monsters in him? And the larger question is, are we monsters? Are there monsters in us? What do you guys think? Start with the first one. Is Sutri a monster? No? Are there monsters in him? Definitely. Tell me about that. Tell me about the monsters uh, that are in Sutri. Yes. He certainly made like a lot of bad mistakes in his life, and he has a lot of bad habits, like the tendency to just run from everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think <clears throat> that is definitely like one of his lesser qualities, and that it can be kind of monstrous the way we kind of just like slipped about. Abandonment, mm -hmm. abandoning people, communities, various things. Interesting, given that that we see him basically willing to die for Ab Jones. Like, he's going to get Jones home, and Jones is like, no, get away from me, young blood. Like, you got to get out of here, you know. Ab knows what the score is, and Sutri's like, I'm not, I'm not going to leave you. So he does have um, the capacity, Sutri does, to be loyal when it matters. And there's something moving, and to me, moving and redemptive about his refusal to leave Ab. And then as a kind of gesture of, of defiance against the authority that he rages against, you know, runs the police car off into the river and all that. Elizabeth? I was going to say, grief. Isn't, is grief a monster? Grief is a monster. That's very interesting. Can you say more about that? I don't know. I think grief. I think grief can be something really lovely, um, but when you don't deal with it and you don't process it, you definitely call it a grief. It turns into this like monster that's going to kind of ruin your life. Um, that's beautifully said. I'm thinking about this idea that you bring up. 
about grief being a monster and Sutri's feeling that by interacting with the world, touching the world, touching people, that he ruins them, damns them in some way. Have you guys ever felt like that? Has anyone ever had that feeling that anything, like, that you're, I hate to use the word, I hate to use the word toxic, but we'll use the word toxic today. That, or they just like that you're poisonous, venomous, and somehow the things that you touch um, wilt and die. Yes? Me? Well, you seem to have your hand up. Okay, Ivy? Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I've had times where it almost felt like I was jumping between friend groups and, like, kind of piggybacking off of, like, their general, like, hobby that they did, and it almost felt bad that I couldn't bring something to the table, so to speak, and that it almost felt like when I was around it seemed like everyone else wasn't having as good of a time as they would have if I weren't there. But at the same time, I couldn't bring myself to just leave because it was like I needed something to feel like I belonged. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I definitely feel like when it comes to this, I guess, the, I guess to- this toxicity, I think there is a tendency, uh, or at least an impulse, to believe that, that you are uh, the cause of your... I, I, it's kind of a general thing that you are the cause of your own problems. Everything that's goes wrong is because of something you do but then when you really stop to think about it it, it starts to get a little more muddied in that area and it's it did I you find you, you really maybe you might have been a factor but there are there are other things going on as well but there still is that impulse that uh, within that you ruined it you you caused all these these issues mm. do you think we all have monsters in us or is it just people like Sutri? Is it everybody? I think everyone's got something, but... Not something, monsters. I mean, everyone's, everyone's got something that could be considered a monster. It just depends on how you look at it and what your experiences are. Yes, ma'am. I think everybody has a chance of becoming a monster, of having that like monster they have that side of themselves that can just like turn. Mm-hmm. Is there a difference between being a monster and having a monster inside you, right? Because those are two different statements. Yes. Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I, I think the difference is action. Uh, what you do to other people sort of determines what kind of person you are. Uh, you can't think of a single person ever not having a bad thought or right. something. Bad impulses. Bad impulses. Yeah, like I suppose you could contain monsters and like a jail or a prison or a cage, like keep them housed, right? Keep them jailed, don't let them free. Um, you know, you have people talk this way, right? And they let the beast out, they let the monster out. They can't do that. Alcohol has properties in that regard, it seems. It seems to bring out doesn't seem to bring out the best in people from my experiences. It seems to bring out um, at least the dumb in people. There's also the question of what constitutes as uh, monstrous in a way because the question is with Sutri in particular, his case, it's hard to determine whether he really is a monster or not because the thing is a lot of what he does, a lot of the things he, he does in general is due to inaction rather than taking a more malicious uh, conscious like action. Although he does consciously leave, a lot of the time it's he's just separating himself for, uh, uh, through it. He's not actively engaging with that issue to make it worse or whatnot. So I really, I really guess it just depends on what whether or not you need that that real malicious intent for it to be monstrous. Or and he's based on what he's doing, how he's living, compared to like his potential. Right, like that's the that's the chasm for me. It's like what he's capable of being, as opposed to living in a houseboat on the river that will sink if he doesn't tend to constantly, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Helping Harrogate, which I mean, there's a hole in the Harrogate boat 
that no amount of patching is, and like Sutri can't save Harrogate. Uh, we see Harrogate end up going to the penitentiary. He's finally devised a scheme so ridiculous that he's going away to like, to real labor. He starts off as a petty criminal or whatever his behavior with watermelons are. Deviance, deviance is a good word for it, right? To I don't want to like watermelon shame, but it goes from like you know deviance to, I mean, it's still like, I guess he gets popped for robbing a store, right? He actually, he goes from the scheme with the parking meter. Are there parking meters anymore? Do those exist? Yeah, I think they still do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I haven't seen many parking meters anymore because I rarely see. Um, Coins change. Oh, with the with electronic. Don't even start with me. Uh, we're gonna have to talk about Joyce. Okay, well let's just let's start there. Let's start with. Uh, what are your feelings about Joyce? Just kind of starting off as a character. What I mean, we'll say initially, not to not where the relationship devolves. Overjoyced. <laughs> Overjoyced, yeah. <laughs> it's nice that he is pursuing a grown ass woman, as you say. Okay. Other initial thoughts about Joyce? I like her. Tell me about it. She seemed like smart and she had a personality and she was funny and she was like taking care of him, even though that's not like like she's giving him money, you know, and that's not like typically a way that a woman has in a relationship, especially if It seems like, like in a weird way, that finally Sutri has met. I don't know if equal is the right. She might be that, but I don't know if it's the right terminology. But like he's a match in some way. Like they, get each other. they do get each other, and like he is interested in her, like beyond the sex of it all. Right there's that initial kind of thing, but there's this sense that like, he can talk to her, they can do things together, um, and you kind of see what going. I mean, to a certain, I mean, a certain degree, going straight would be for Sutri. Like he's living, <laughs> like in some basement with no windows, right? And often, often, like when women find. Uh, like find a guy and start dating him. Like, I mean, how many of the women in this room have started dating a dude and their circumstances, particularly their living circumstances, are like kind of not great. Their apartment smells like banana peels. They just have posters like taped to the wall with electrical tape. They've got like a bed that's just a mattress on the floor. With I'm not hating. We've all been there. A bed that's just a mattress on the floor and like they got a television on top of the box that it came in. Their only piece of furniture is an Xbox and like a lot. Have you seen like all the memes like on wherever, whatever social media you like to get on is like some dude like rate my setup and it's like an apartment, no pictures, no furniture, like a lawn chair, a TV like that close to the lawn chair and like a, a little, what do they call like a little ref cooler kind of refrigerator kind of thing. And then like all the dudes, all the dudes would be like 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. And then the women underneath would be like, what is wrong with you people, right? Which, I mean, I've said this before, if, if it weren't for women, men would live in a cardboard box down by the river. I mean, they may not even get down by the river, just be like, They'd be living like the rag picker <laughs> under a bridge. They'd be bridge trolls. Um, so yeah, they start off together, and she's there's this kind of elevation, like in terms of living situation. She gets him out of the out of the sad windowless room, like into like an upstairs situation. <coughs> And then they occupy like this place that kind of isn't bad for a while. Like you can kind of look out over Knoxville, 
and they start living. What is the right word? A simulation of a normal life. Because it isn't a normal life, right? Her work isn't what we would call necessarily normal, whatever that is. By the way, neither is Sutri's, right? Neither, so I mean, they suit each other pretty interesting and in pretty interesting ways because of that. Um, and like, she goes to work, she goes on business trips, he goes to see his friends. There's something very interesting that happens. I think it's interesting on page 400. In the morning, she took him shopping. Sutry in gray tweeds being fitted. I love this, she said. What, shopping? For men's things, it's sexy. They selected shirts and ties and cufflinks. They studied shoes in a glass case. A sleek attendant hovered. Wednesday noon, he appeared at Comer's in a pair of alligator shoes, wearing a camel hair overcoat, a pair of beltless gabardine slacks with little zippers at the sides, and a wine-colored shirt with a crafty placket requiring no buttons. Fucking Sutry's Rob Squires Green, said Jake. Stud grinned and wiped the countertop before him. What do you have, Sut? I think I'll go for the steak and gravy. Ulysses leaned on the counter and studied him. He took Sutry's lapel between his thumb and forefinger and eased the coat open to read the label, nodding sagely a toothpick in his mouth. Fishing business has picked up a bit, hasn't it, he said. Fishy business, more likely, said Sexton posed beneath his picture on the wall in flight gear, tapping his thigh with the wooden triangle and watching down the hall. Let me have a chocolate milk, said Sutri. And then she comes back, and he's begun to take care of her money, and she begins sending him $100 bills in the mail when she's Gone on business. What do you what do you make of the whole um, Sutri glow up, Sutri makeover kind of attempt by Joyce? What's going on here? <laughs> tell me about tell me about the sugar baby. He's the sugar baby. Yeah. Oh wow! I never I didn't know that that ex I've heard of sugar daddies. And so, like, he's, he, she's a sugar mommy. I don't like the way that all that sounds. Um, interesting. Other takes on this, like her taking him shopping for, for these clothes. Yeah. It's like she has a pet boyfriend, for lack of a better term. And she's just yeah. kind of dragging him along, like, dressing him up. He's unpassive enough of a person to kind of project a lot of things onto such tree. It's sort of. Like, her life is a mess, so she's trying to fix him, which is kind of what we, we were talking about with um, how women tend to collect men who can't take care of themselves because women who can't take care of themselves, they need a distraction. Her life is a mess, so she's trying to fix him is a pretty interesting statement. Alligator shoes, camel hair coats, not the usual, doesn't seem like the usual shopping shopping spree for a dude yeah it, i don't know i mean it, it strikes me as very I, he did the same thing to himself right his uncle died he got the inheritance he went shopping bought new shoes new clothes i mean you know what i mean i, I don't mm -hmm. know if relationship has much to do with it i think he's someone who just likes spending money on nice things without thinking about it well and she likes spending money on him and then sending him money to take care of for her. What's that relationship called? What's, what is the name we have for a guy who manages the money for a woman who is doing sex work? A pimp. She's even dressing him up in pimp attire, right? pretty interesting. 
she later tells him stories about quote pimps and tricks and all this kind of stuff right it's pretty interesting what Sutri is turning into inside of this relationship um there also seems to be a sense that both of them are trying to buy their way out of the reality they find themselves in. Like, in everything about this relationship, everything about the two of them, it's like glittering on the surface, and then underneath there's decay, right? Including, like, the little apartment they get together is, like, kind of okay, but you go up the stairwell and there are holes punched in the walls, right? So there's, there's that particular that particular sense at what point do you think her <sighs> occupation begins to bother him do you think it does bother him Page 400. I'm sorry, 404. Spring that year came early. There were sunny mornings sitting in the little kitchen drinking coffee and reading the papers. There were flowers in the dooryard, yellow jonquils tottering up through the cinders and loam. She was arrested in New Orleans in early May and he had to wire her $500. She came back fat and unchastened. She said that if she ever started to work anywhere bigger than Knoxville, would he please kick her ass? And little as he liked to promise things, he said he would. He woke in the light of various hours to find her gone or going, just returned. Sprawled in the heat with her heavy thighs agop, and sweat lightly beaded on her forehead like the dew of fevered dreams, light tracery of old razor scars on her inner wrists, her scarred paunch and peltlet of coiled black kid's hair. He tried the weight of her softly cupped rosebud teat in his palm, and she shifted languorously, one foot trapped in a tourniquet of bed sheet. What do you make of the joinery of the razor scars with this woman's life. Yeah. Well, I think in a way that would be self-loathing. I mean, that's usually an indicator of self-loathing or self-hatred and uh, okay. dis discontent with one's life. Or okay. Just outright hatred of it. Yeah. Yeah, you have um, you have symbols like physical physical tracings of bad times, right? Razor scars and and these various things, right? We don't know the the particulars of the story, but we can imagine pretty vividly, right? And what this woman's life has been. Um, how it started, where it's going. Um, there's a real ugliness to the initially, um, sorry, Heidi, uh, to the initially uh, glittering, sexy uh, veneer that we, we see from the jump. Um, and then there's, I mean, these really weird things begin to happen, right? She kind of has a, a, a fit right in a in a bar and he has to like kind of drag her out and then like she kicks the kicks the dash kicks the rear view window what's going on with her yeah why Yeah. Why does, like, a new relationship cover um, 
old trauma for a while. And it feels like that that's often the sort of pattern, like two people get together, they both have pasts, they both carry baggage, as all adults do to some degree. Um, and then like the new the new relationship seems to make things all right for a while. And then problems emerge. Why is that? Because you're pretending to be the best possible person for yourself to lure someone else in. Right. And they're not exactly being the most honest with you about the, your own personality and stuff. And when you have someone who looks at you like you are good and that you matter, it makes it so much easier to pretend to be Yeah. Together. You think, oh, maybe maybe this is the person that is going to allow me to be this best possible version of yourself, right? Maybe maybe I'll be able to change for this person. Maybe what I've been missing is this person. Elizabeth? You get distracted by something new and shiny, and then you get a little bored of it, and then you go. And it's still you sitting there. It's almost like a New Year's resolution in a sense of, like, you're like, all right, like, I've got things that I need to fix, and this is the year I'm going to commit to fixing them. But then eventually, however long it may take, it's going to wear away. You yeah. Know, like you're committing to being your new, like, proper self for this person, but eventually you're going to get complacent and slip back into what it was that was an issue before. In the midst of all their good times, when they're, like, you know, taking trips, and they're going to Asheville and, you know, seeing all these things, um, the trappings of their life a Jaguar convertible and uh, new clothes and luxury and trips, vacations, um, seem to Sutri as if they ought to be satisfying. And then he has that thought, why then this loneliness? And that is a question, I think, that runs throughout the entire novel. Like, if he has found a community with these people by the river, if he is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, why then this loneliness? I think it's a case of attacking the symptoms, not the problem, mm -hmm. in a way. Like, he's trying, he has this underlying problem, and there are symptoms that outbreak from that problem, and everything he's trying to do to fix it attacks that symptoms, but does nothing to address the problem that's leading to those symptoms. Okay. Um, fantastic comment. What then is that underlying problem? I think because his underlying problem is because again you, you were talking about like throughout again throughout uh, he is still he is feeling lonely throughout like that is a thing mm -hmm. that uh, comes to the thing. He's also trying to find different groups of belonging, different people. Like mm -hmm. he'll shack up with that. Jones, Callahan, Harrogate, he'll go with Reese, he'll go with all these different people, mm -hmm. but I think it's, I think it's might be a product, because I think, because obviously throughout the thing, his whole, his family issues, the family issues he had is always looming over his head and he never addresses it, but I think it's by, I think it's that, that, I guess that quote, he, may, he has a, he's trying to dissociate with them, but in a way they're still haunting, that's mm -hmm. still, still haunting with him, and no matter how much, much he tries to disconnect it, He's still attached to them, and therefore he's having difficulty attaching with others. He lacks a purpose. He lacks a purpose. Is is not being a, is being a fisherman not enough purpose? Um, it would if Sutri cared about it. Think about it. He, we've been a fisherman for s several hundred chapters. How much do we hear about how much he likes fishing, or how much he cares about fishing? Right. Right. Someone else's. It's, it's like it's a purpose, but it's not the purpose that he wants to have. The purpose. Like, similar to, to what I touched on earlier about, like, not knowing what you bring to the table. It's like, you can have all your friends be like, no, like, we like having you around. This is what you bring to the table, this mm -hmm. and that and the other. Like, you're worth something. But then it's like if you can't internalize that and generate it, that feeling of like goodness and self worth on your own, it's kind of you get similar to how Sutri was, where it's just like, like yeah, like being a fisherman has a purpose, but 
doesn't serve a purpose to him. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth? I also think it's um, the rejection of his family. Like, as long as he continues rejecting his family, he's rejecting himself. Why is that? What, why is rejecting your family rejecting yourself? very interesting is there something that will satisfy this loneliness that Sutri talks about for Sutri for anyone who's feeling it is there a fix for this or is this something everyone feels at different points maybe not always Yes. Um, building off of that, he like does a lot of this shopping and he like presents himself as this new person in all of these new fancy clothes. He gets to shave, he gets to alligator your shoes and all of that, but he's still the same person. He hasn't changed at all despite the way that he's presenting himself. Yeah. He's also not his talents and his gifts are not being deployed. He's not being used. He's not of service in the way he could be because he has so many gifts. I think probably the best human beings can do on this crazy planet is to find a group of people to whom they could be a service with the talents that they have, right? So you find a group that you fit into and that you understand your role and that whatever gifts you have are of use to this group. I think it's about as good as a person can do. Um, It seems to be how we have both spiritually and physically evolved on on this planet. Sutri thinks about, this is on page 414, if there are things he would repent of, if there are things that he is sorry for. And he's talking, of course, with himself. Um, And at first he says that there is nothing for which he'd repent. And then he rethinks it. One thing, I spoke with bitterness about my life. And I said that I would take my own part against the slander of oblivion and against the monstrous facelessness of it, and that I would stand a stone in the very void where all would read my name. Of that vanity, I recant all. There are names for things. There are names for stones that men stand um, in the very void where people can read their name. Right? There are names for these things. Never mind, it's all right. I lost it. That's all right. Do you think that it is vanity to want to be remembered after you're gone? No? I think that everyone is afraid of being forgotten after they're gone because I feel like if they were forgotten, then it's like what was the entire point of them being here in the first place? Yeah, if you if some part of you doesn't last, there's this sense. Being remembered after you're gone is a kind of is an interesting thing. Especially being remembered after you're gone by people who never knew you. Like, none of us met Cormac, but we're remembering him. He's been gone almost a year now. 
And like, we're kind of circling back to them. That's a pretty interesting thing that hundreds of thousands of people who've never met you, maybe millions worldwide, have thoughts about you, affection for or hatred for you, depending on how they interact with your books, right? There's the, the reverse of that is the way we feel about the great monsters of history, you know, Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot and these people, right? And they never seem to go away, right? You're always wrestling with their horrific legacy. And, and, and media keeps these faces and voices alive. Uh, I saw on Twitter the other day, and thank goodness for AI for all the wonderful things it's done. It has translated Hitler's speeches into English. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. But But somehow, like, gotten Hitler's voice to match with the English. So now you can li listen to Hitler's speeches as they would have sounded in English with all the inflection. And I'm like, what in the world are we doing? Like, no cure for cancer. Thanks, AI. N none of the, like, not solve the end of our problems. We have Hitler's speeches in English. <laughs> yes? Just yeah? Why would someone yeah. think of doing that? That's my reaction. That, and then of course, like you look at it, all the problems the world has, and someone's thing. You know what we need right now? <laughs> I need Hitler in English. Yeah, right. Insane. Um, there are a number of elegies toward the end of this book, eulogies as well, and Sutri finds the rag picker the who he remembers from the time he was a boy. He could make the dolls to talk, right, is, is something we're told early on about the rag picker. This is on page 421. Sutri pulled a chair up and sat and watched him. He passed his hand across his face and sat forward holding his knuckles. Well, he said, what do you think now? God, you are pathetic. Did you know that? Pathetic. Sutri looked around. These boys have been at your things. You forgot about the gasoline, I guess. Never got around to it. Did you really remember me? I couldn't remember my bear's name. He had corduroy feet. My mother used to sew him up. She gave you sandwiches and apples. Gypsies used to come to the door. We were afraid of them. My sister's bears were Misha and Bruin. I tried, but I can't. The old man lay dim and bleared in his brass bed. Sutri leaned back in the chair and pushed at his eyes with the back of his hand. The day had grown dusk, the rain eased. Pigeons flapped up overhead and preened and crooned. The keeper of this brief vigil said that he'd guessed something of the workings in the wings, the ropes and sandbags and the house light toggles, heard dimly a shuffling and coughing beyond the painted drop of the world. Did you ask about the crap game? What are you doing in bed with your shoes on? He passed his hand through his hair and leaned forward and looked at the old man. You have no right to represent people this way, he said. A man is all men. You have no right to your wretchedness. He wiped his eyes with the heel of his hand. Do you agree with Sutri that a man is all men? That any particular man represents all men? And that there's a responsibility because of that? Or I feel like there should be, but there isn't. Hmm. You know, you still have an early one. Mm-hmm. 
And are they are they two representations of man with a capital M? I think it's interesting the judge has to choose the same word. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he says, each man is tabernacled in every other man, and so on in an endless chain of being and witness. All right, so that's a, this is a thought that Cormac has been percolating on for a while, right? That each man is every man, or that each man is tabernacled in every other man. I think that there is real truth in that probably in a spiritual sense, but also in like a biological sense. That's, that's interesting to contemplate. Um, Sutri leaves Knoxville, sort of the upshot of everything is that, you know, he packs up a cardboard suitcase and leaves this home that he's fretted over and and eulogized and loved and hated and everything. What's the significance of, of Sutri departing? Yeah. I think it um, gives somewhat of a hopeful ending that maybe this book will be different for him. Maybe he will go someplace and, and do better and then be better. Um, but I think uh, just based on the totality, this will be a different story. Interesting. That's generally what people do. Of course, oddly, Cormac himself lived in Knoxville for the first 30 some odd years of his life. And then he packed up and left. And he moved west, first to El Paso, Texas, then to Santa Fe. And not only did he start a new life, like this novel represents a break with all the Appalachian writing, right? His next book after this is something he'd never done before, Blood Meridian, it's a Western. It's three books after that, uh, the Border Trilogy, are also contemporary Westerns. Then the most contemporary Western, No Country for Old Men, which is a Western in its own way. Then The Road, which is a post-apocalyptic novel, right? So this, the end of this book constitutes a break not only for Sutri, but also for Cormac, right? Sutri's loosely based, I'd say quite loosely, on Cormac's own life. So I, I, there's an interesting... Um, metatextual aspect to all of this. Do you guys know, you have this image of the huntsman in the final paragraphs. Do you guys know the myth of the wild hunt? Yes. Yeah. Right? So this goes back into, it extends into all different Celtic and Nordic cultures. But there is a figure sometimes represented by Odin sometimes represented by different Celtic figures. In Welsh, that figure is a, a psychopomp. A psychopomp is someone who ferries uh, the souls of heroes from this world to the other world. The Welsh psycho psychopomp is named Aron Gwyn, spelled just like my name, except Aron is the Celticized version of the Hebrew Aaron, right? And Odin or, or Gwyn Apnud or Aron Gwyn or whatever figure leads a hunt. And they harvest, this hunt harvests souls. There's a terrifying and beautiful and kind of an amazing painting um, by a Scandinavian painter at, toward the end of the 19th century. And this one is of Odin and like he's leading the entire retinue. And they're riding bursting out from the clouds in the sky over earth. And they're reaching down and like grabbing people up, right? And there are men like, like, um, well, gods, demigods, like grabbing women by the hair, like and scooping them up. And the idea is that this this wild hunt will ride over the land and devastate it. And then after that, after this apocalypse, something new grows, something new begins which is a pretty interesting way of processing that. That's also the um, story at the end of the 
New Testament in the book of Revelation, right? It's about like this old world burns away and a, and a new world comes. So it's also, um, it finds its way into cowboy songs and cowboy legend. Ghost Riders in the Sky is based on this whole, like, these riders come from heaven. 471. Hello, said Sutri, climbing in, shutting the door, his suitcase between his knees. Then they were moving. Out across the land, the light wires and road rails were going, and the telephone lines with voices shuttling on like souls. Behind him, the city lay smoking. The sad purlieus of the dead immured with the bones of friends and forebears. Off to the right side, the white concrete of the expressway gleamed in the sun where the ramp curved out into empty air and hung truncate with iron rods bristling among the vectors of nowhere. When he looked back, the water boy was gone. An enormous lank hound had come out of the meadow by the river like a hound from the depths and was sniffing at the spot where Sutri had stood. Somewhere in the gray wood by the river is the huntsman, and in the brooming corn, and in the castellated press of cities. His work lies all wares, and his hounds tire not. I have seen them in a dream, slaverous and wild, and their eyes crazed with ravening for souls in this world. Fly them. Mm -hmm. 